and welcome to today's Atlantic Circle in Conversation session. My name is Magda Joshi and I work as part of the partner philanthropy engagement and partnerships team at UWC Atlantic and I'm delighted to be today's moderator. Uh, Atlantic Circle in Conversation series is an opportunity for alumni and friends of UWC Atlantic to connect and to hear about topics of interest. Today, we have the honor of have, having Dr. Charles Foley, class of 1986, as our guest speaker for today's session. Before we hear from Charles, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that this session is being recorded and you will be able to review it or share it with friends after today's event. Um, the event will last about 60 minutes. During the first half, uh, we'll hear from Charles, and in the second part, there will also be time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, through the chat. So as uh, we hear, um, as we listen to Charles, if you have any questions for our speaker, please submit them through um, the chat function on uh, Zoom. During the talk, unless you are asking your question later on, we would be grateful if, if you could please remain on mute. Um, uh, uh, I think that's that's it for for the housekeeping. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Charles Foley, uh, in his today's talk, Elephants and Ivory, Why Older Females Are So Important in Elephant Society, will describe what makes elephants so fascinating. Uh, Charles uh, is our alumnus class of 86 and also a parent of a current uh, first year student at UWC Atlantic. Uh, after graduating from the college, he went on to study zoology at Oxford University for his undergraduate studies and then behavioral ecology at Princeton University for his PhD. His career in African wildlife began in 1990 when he and a colleague conducted the first ever census of elephants on Mount Kilimanjaro. Over the subsequent two decades, Charles and his wife, Lara, researched a diverse range of topics, including elephant demography, behavior, genetics, and human elephant conflict. After moving from Tanzania to the US in 2019, Charles joined Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo as a senior conservation scientist with the zoo's Tanzania Conservation Research Program. We're delighted to have Charles with us today and now I hand over to our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda. Let me share my screen over here with everyone. Good, so hopefully if all goes if all's well, you should be looking at a picture of an elephant in a field of yellow flowers. So what I'm gonna to do today um, is First, we'll just tell you about um, a bit about elephants, elephant behavior, elephant um, biology, and and what makes them such fascinating animals. Um, and I am then going to talk about some of the results of our twenty six years of research um, in um, in northern Tanzania. And I will then end up with a synopsis of the ivory trade and what is happening at the moment. Um, to what, what's been done to curtail it. So um, we worked for many years in Tarangiri National Park. It's in Tanzania in East Africa, and it's one of the main parks on the Northern Tour circuit. It's close to the Serengeti, and you've also got Mount Kilimanjaro. And Tarangiri is your classic savanna ecosystem. You've got baobabs, acacia tortillas, um, etc. And it also has pretty much all of the um, African savanna animals that you'd expect to find in this area. Everything except black rhino, which went extinct in the 1980s. And the park is dominated by the Terengiri River. And this is the only, it provides really the only dry season um, water source. Um, and so as a result, in the dry season, the animals congregate around the river. And then when it rains, they move out. And it's a huge movement. It's over 80,000 animals will be moving out of the national park um, onto community lands. It's one of the top five um, largest migrations of um, large mammals on the planet. And Terengiri is um, perhaps most famous for its elephant population. Um, there are over 4,000 elephants 
um, in the park at the moment. And it really is one of the best parks in Africa to see large herds of relaxed elephants. Now, there really is something about elephants which appeals to humans. And um, I bet you, if you go and stop people in the street and say, name me your uh, five um, animals that you're interested in, elephants is almost guaranteed to be on people's lists. And colleagues and I debate why this is. And partly it's probably the size, partly it's uh, just the, the tremendous sociality that they display. Um, but I think, uh, for me, certainly, it's the, what appeals to me is, is the trunk. And the trunk is a, it's a suffusion of the, um, of the nose and the upper lip. And it's an astonishing organ. So an elephant can uh, pick up a flower petal with its trunk, um, and it can also knock down a tree with its trunk. So um, really, there's no other organ like it in the animal kingdom. Now, when you first start studying elephants, what, what you notice is that, well, they're, they're really rather large. Um, and I still remember my very first day when I went out into the field to study them and I had set up my research camp and I had some staff to assist me and I had my little Jeep and uh, my pencil notebook. I was now officially a researcher and I went out and I sort of found an elephant, group of elephants and this female sort of lifted her head, took one look at me and came charging towards the car. So being nobody's fool, I put the car into reverse and got out of there and a little bit shaken. I went and found another group and the same thing happened and again and again and again. And um, after two weeks of this, I was kind of shell-shocked because I had sort of convinced my committee at Princeton that, yes, I'd have no problems at all. So these animals are all going to be very tame. And here I was being sort of chased high and low over the savannah. So I, I went to talk to um, a chap um, called Rob Glenn, very famous sculptor who was living in the park at the time. And Rob professed to know a lot about elephants. He said, Charles, listen, if an elephant attacks you and it's screaming and trumpeting and uh, dust all over it, all over the place, don't worry, that's probably a bluff. So what you've really got to watch out for is when they come straight towards you, ears flat back, trunks rolled up, and don't deviate for everything. So I thought, well, I better go and test it out or go back to Princeton and study crickets or something. Um, so I went and found a group of elephants which I knew didn't like me. And I drove up and um, just in case Rob was wrong, I hid under the steering wheel of the car. And this female, came charging down towards the car, but she was trumpeting and screaming. So I thought, okay, there's a good sign. And then she stopped five meters away from the car. And I thought, that's it, that's how you do it. And then she charged again. And this time she came right up to the door of the car and she put a tusk right over the roof. And at this point, I'm seriously cursing Rob Glenn. But then waited a few moments, the dust settled and I looked up and she looked down and you know how you sometimes look at an animal and you just know they're not gonna hurt you? And sure enough, she turns around, she lets out a trombonic fart, and she walks off. And what I realized is that in elephant society, if you turn your bum to an elephant, you are subordinate to it. If you run away from an elephant, you are highly subordinate to it. So for the next couple of months, I spent most of my time just challenging the elephants until eventually they gave up and stopped chasing me. Mostly they stopped chasing me. Um, this was a little unfortunate for two reasons. Um, this elephant hit the car. Um, first of all, it was a brand new vehicle. And secondly, it was the very first day in the field for my Tanzanian master's student. And he had uh, just spent a whole year doing his um, <clears throat> theory and his very first day in the field and this female elephant, she had a bad day and she picked up the car and smashed it up and pushed it about 40, 50 yards. Um, so after she did that, uh, I said, okay, let's call it a day and went back to my camp and I was, I was, I was working in my tent and uh, one of uh, the staff came and said, Charles, you gotta come and help us because the, the new student, he's sitting in the car in his towel and refusing to come out. And what had happened was that poor guy had sort of gone um, to take a shower. We have a little bucket shower. And um, we'd all forgotten to tell him that there's a bird bath about uh, 10 foot away from the shower. And a female lioness was coming in and drinking from the bird bath. Um, and so he stepped out of the bird bath, uh, saw the lioness and went, ah, and the lioness went, ah, and they both ran in different directions. And there he was sitting in the car refusing to come out. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've lost him on the very first day. 
But, you know, all credit to him. He actually continued. He actually finished his master's, um, but he now works in the medical field. And here's a camp. Um, so we lived over here for many, many years. It's just uh, tents with thatch roof. Here's the um, kitchen. Uh, we used to bring in water from a lodge. And uh, here's the infamous uh, bucket shower. Um, and uh, we would cut the grass around camp just because you don't want to step out at night and step on a snake. But what's interesting is that the animals would see that almost as a physical boundary. So during the day, they would seldom actually cross um, that, uh, that, that boundary. And so we're perfectly safe uh, standing over there. Well, at night, it was, it was quite different. Animals would move through, but not, not during the day. And um, our girls, so Elsmere is um, on the right. She's now her first year at Atlanta College. And they grew up over here um, in the bush. And um, Elsmere would come out uh, quite often with us when we went out to do our research. And then later on, when we were in um, move to Arusha for they could go to schooling, we'd, we'd also sort of um, bring them in when we were doing some interesting activities like radio collaring, et cetera. And when you bring up children in a national park, um, what you, you have to be very aware of the fact that many things can actually eat them. Um, and you know, what's astonishing to me is that the sounds of a baby crying is a guarantee to bring in predators like lions or leopards. And in fact, we had one friend that their kid was crying all night. And in the morning, there was a big python sitting outside their tent. Um, and so my wife would typically get up um, and, um, and feed uh, the kids if, if they were crying. And from a very early age, we had to teach them what to do if they were walking through camp and an elephant charged them, which I suspect is probably not the conversation most parents have with their young children. Now, when you're studying elephants, the, you need to get to know them individually. Um, and what you do is you use their ears. So you, they um, have different ear patterns. So this one over here has nice notches and rips and tears on its ears. And otherwise, the venation patterns on the ears are a bit like human fingerprints. And it allows you to tell the elephants apart. And once you get to know them well, they've got different personalities. Some of them are fairly um, hoity and don't really want to know you. And others, this is Fujo, a young male. He would always come up to the car and play with a radio antenna on the car. And elephant society is it's, it's a matriarchal society, right? It's dominated by the older females. And these the females will live in family groups and pretty much stay in these family groups for life. And so a family group will be um, one female and her young and their offspring or two sisters and their offspring. And it can vary in size anywhere from two to over 60 individuals. And within elephant society, there's an expanding level of sociality. So you start off with um, the mother infant unit and the family group. And then when groups split up um, because they get too big, they form what's called bond groups, which share about, spend about 30% of their time together. And several bond groups will form a clan, which share the same dry season range. And several clans form a subpopulation, which share the same wet season range. And um, several subpopulations form the population as a whole. And various studies have been done to show that there are indeed genetic underpinnings. Um, to this structure. That's the females. What about the males? Well, what happens with the males is that they tend to leave the family group at a fairly early age. In fact, in Terengiri, it's a very young, um, by age eight or nine, they're already leaving the family group. And then they go off either by themselves or in small groups of other bull elephants. And male elephants spend an awful lot of their time simply pushing each other around. And this is really important because they need to know who is stronger. When, what happens is that when elephants reach a certain age, it's normally uh, 18 for the first time, they come into what's known as must. And must is an Urdu term. It means intoxicated. And um, the elephants become very aggressive. They start streaming from their temporal glands behind their eyes, start dribbling, dribbling urine almost continuously. Um, they have very exaggerated body movements. And it's a statement of intent. So don't mess with me, um, I'm big, I'm strong, um, and I'll beat you up. And what happens is that the biggest males, they come into must at the optimum time, which is when most of the females are restless. And so the biggest males will monopolize all the breeding. Whereas the younger males, if they come into must, it'll be at a um, young stage. And it's a non-cheatable system. So I remember on one occasion seeing a young male, he was about 19 years old. 
and he was in muscle, first time ever, big jolt of testosterone through his body. And he was standing by the by the side of the road, just shaking. And then he found a bush and he sort of beat the bush. And then he found a tree and he knocked down the tree. And then he found some females and he sort of beat up one of the females. And then he ran into a big male. And this big male knocked the stuffing out of him. And the young male dropped out of muscle just like that, right? And that is how it's controlled. And there was a fascinating paper that was written um, came out of South Africa a number of years ago. And um, it shows what can go wrong if you mess around with a system like this. And what happened was that they were introducing bull elephants in, or they were introducing elephants in general into Pilanisberg National Park in South Africa. And so they brought over some family groups and they also brought over some young males um, in the early teens. And for the first few years, everything was fine. And then they started having a problem. And the problem was that these bull elephants were chasing, hunting down and killing the rhino. And it wasn't just one or two rhino, they killed over 40 rhino. And when they brought in the animal behaviorists to find out what was going on, they discovered that these young males, they were coming into must and staying into must in must for weeks. And they simply did not know how to cope with it. They were literally going mad. And so what they did was they brought in a few older males and they reestablished the uh, normal dominance hierarchy and the problem was solved. Here's my wife, Lara, um, and uh, following a group of elephants. We um, knew, to the, we would follow 28 different family groups of elephants. We knew over a thousand elephants individually. And in each family group would have um, individuals with names starting with the same letter. So Adina, Asia, Adria, Keisha, et cetera. And um, when you know that many elephants, it really, it really just does become like a huge soap opera. And when you spend any time with elephants and monitoring elephants, etc., you notice just how social these animals are. They're constantly touching each other. They're constantly communicating with each other, rubbing up against each other. Infants are seldom more than a few meters away from the other individuals. And um, there are certain advantages conferred to this group living. One of them is the fact that you have ready access to um, aunties, what we call allo mothers. And these are young female, not young nulliparous females who haven't had infants yet. And they will basically look after their brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, et cetera. And if an infant falls asleep, they will make sure that we get, wakes up before the group moves off. If an infant wanders off to another group, they'll go back and collect it. And this not only increases the um, survival rates of the infants, but it also teaches these young females how to be good mothers. The other factor that influences uh, sociality in elephants is predation. And you know, people don't really think about um, elephants having um, predators, but in Southern Africa, particularly in places like Botswana and Namibia, um, the elephant uh, lion prides have learned how to take down elephants. And typically what happens is you get very large prides of lions and they will simply chase an elephant, chase an elephant group, chase it until one of the elephants just gives up. And then they bring it down and they can bring down pretty large elephants, even some elephants that are about 15, 16 years old. Um, and what's interesting in places like Central Africa where there are no lions and hyenas, um, elephant group sizes are much smaller. And the um, family groups, they will go to great lengths to defend each other. And, you know, elephants, if, if you look in, in the press, there's often many stories about altruism in elephants, elephants going into a river to try and um, save um, baby elephants, etc. cetera. And um, this was really sort of brought home to us on one occasion when we were radio calling some elephants in the central area of the park. And when we radio collar, we like to use a helicopter. And on this occasion, we had a big uh, Bell Ranger helicopter. It's a big six heater, it's like massive thing, makes huge amounts of noise. And with a helicopter, you can go in, you can dart the elephant that you want. You never dart the matriarch. If you dart the matriarch, the rest of the group will always be with her when she uh, sleep, goes to sleep. So you dart one of the other females, and then you can um, use a helicopter to guide the animals away from roads or rivers. And typically what happens is that the animal that's been darted just drags behind, and by the time it goes to sleep, the other animals are, have long gone. Now on this occasion, we were doing this in a swamp and the female that had been darted, she called and the matriarch heard her and turned back and came to her. And by this point, the uh, darted female was asleep on the ground and the matriarch got down on her knees and put a tusk and trunk underneath the fallen animal and lifted it right back up onto its feet. And we were worried that um, she might hurt 
um, the sleeping animal. And so we came in to push her away. And so we came in fast in this helicopter about 20 feet above the ground. And you know what this matriarch does? She turns around and tries to pull the helicopter out of the sky with her trunk. It took us five minutes to get her far enough away from the fallen animal that we could safely get down on the ground. Quite remarkable animals. I'm gonna show you a series of photographs taken by a Swiss doctor called Horst Munzig in Serengeti National Park in 1968. As far as I know, they are one of the only, if not the only, um, series of photos showing the death of a matriarch. Now, the animal in question is um, over here in the bottom left, and she had been walking very slowly for two days um, prior to this. And 10 minutes before this, she had stopped walking, and now she starts to collapse. And she calls, and her family group comes running uh, to her. And she collapses, and eventually she dies. And pandemonium breaks out. The elephants, they're screaming, they're trumpeting, they try to lift her up, they try to roll her over. This goes on for quite a while. And then they start moving away a little bit, everyone except for um, a one young animal, it looks like about five or six year old male, probably her last calf. And then the elephants went and they spent about two hours feeding on the ridge above. And then the um, next oldest female, now the new matriarch, she called them all back and they all marched over to the dead matriarch and they stood there for the rest of the day. And while when you study um, animal behavior, people always say you shouldn't anthropomorphize, etc. cetera, um, the point is elephants are incredibly intelligent, incredibly social and sentient beings. And it seems uh, perfectly obvious to me that they would be able to understand um, the issues surrounding death of one of their family members. And what's interesting is that elephants have a series of behaviors that they really only exhibit around other dead animals. Over here, there's a, a young infant has died. Um, and so for instance, there are bones of animals all around the savanna. If you drive along, there's buffalo bones and wildebeest bones, et cetera, that have been eaten uh, by lions. And elephants will completely ignore those. But if they pass by an elephant carcass, they always uh, will pull up the bones. They often uh, play with them. They'll often put them in their mouths. And um, they will often turn around and touch a carcass with the sole of the rear feet. Why they do that, I've no idea. And they also have a behavior where um, <clears throat> they will stand next to a carcass and move from side to side for a few seconds, emitting a low rumble, a sound before moving on. And I've only ever seen them do that around carcasses. And on one occasion, um, there was a female elephant that had died of anthrax, which is quite common um, in that area. And she had been burnt. And two years later, I was following a young a group of two uh, young elephants and they passed over the spot where she had died and they both stood and started swaying and rumbling. And I got out and I looked and there was nothing on the ground to show that um, an elephant had died there. So I suspect either they recognized the spot or else they could smell shards of bone um, still in the soil. Here's a nice old bull uh, from Ngorongoro Crater. Not too many males like him anymore um, around Africa because frankly, most of them have been shot. And the reason that elephants um, get killed is for the ivory. And the ivory is just the upper incisors. Um, and ivory is just, it's just dentine, it's calcium carbonate, it's what you and I have in our teeth. And yet elephants have been persecuted for the ivory for millennia. And throughout history, there have been waves of poaching. So when Livingston first went to Africa, we um, believe that about 30 to 40,000 elephants a year were being killed to supply the ivory market, which at that time was the growth of the middle class in America and the demand for ivory for piano keys. Um, and in 1970, um, there was another big spike in um, ivory poaching, which was linked to the OPEC oil crisis. And as you probably know, when there is a, a big instability in world markets, traders often look towards bullion uh, as commodities to, to trade as bullion, and um, they started buying ivory. And the price of ivory skyrocketed over the next 20 years. Um, and during that period of time, 
um, between 1970 and 1989, we, had to, we think that about 600,000 elephants were killed across Africa. And it was only in 1989 when the CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, which is a UN organization, um, they passed a complete ban on ivory uh, products um, and elephant products that the poaching stopped. So I'm going to show a picture of a dead elephant. So if you don't like them, please look away from the next slide. Um, so during that time, um, you would go around and find poached elephants with their faces um, cut off. Um, or more likely, you would just find the remains of bones hidden um, under bushes, et cetera. And that's all that remained of these animals. Now, the thing is this, when people talk about poaching, they typically talk about um, numbers of elephants. So 50,000 elephants were killed in Tanzania in that time. Kenya lost 95% of its elephants, Uganda 98% of its elephants. But numbers alone don't tell the whole story because, um, Poaching is a selective process. If you are a poacher, you want to shoot um, the animals with the biggest tusks. So who do you shoot? You shoot the males. Shoot the males in the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 30s. And then who do you move on to? The females, because they have the, the biggest females, have the biggest tusks, and they also form a defensive circle around the young. And so what you find in heavily poached populations is you've got a very highly skewed sex structure with very few males and highly skewed age structure with very few females. And um, even in a heavily poached population, it, you can have a um, situation where you may have no individual over the age of 30. It's like your classic Lord of the Flies scenario. And what happened in Tarangiri was that some of the family groups stayed inside the national park at the height of the poaching. And as a result, um, they had a relatively normal age structure with um, some older females and others um, like Crosstusk when I first knew her, it was just her and her infant. She had lost all her family group members and all her bond group members because these elephants had spent more of the time outside the safety of the national park. And what this did was that, in a sense, it set up a large scale experiment in social dynamics, which allowed me to compare groups with old and young matriarchs to see what impact does it have to have an old matriarch. And to be honest, um, for many years, the first 10 years, um, there was very little impact. All the elephants seemed to be doing well and breeding, etc. But there was one year where there was a severe difference. And that was right at the start of the study um, in 1994. And there was a severe drought. And all the vegetation just basically disappeared in the park. Um, you'd see zebra and willoughbys just walking around and uh, dropping down dead. Um, and many of the, of the elephants left the national park. They, they just took off and I don't know where they went. But some remained. And the ones that remained um, had a very hard time. They became emaciated. Every day they'd have to move from the river up one ridge, down the next uh, valley, up to the next ridge to feed. Um, the mothers uh, lost, uh, stopped lactating. The, so the infants were weaned and many of them abandoned the infants. And the lucky infants, um, would they would be killed by lions and hyenas um, that night. The unlucky ones would eventually die basically of heat thirst. And in the last few hours, what they do, the little ones, they put their mouths inside uh, their, their trunks inside their mouths and suck up liquid and pour it over their ears to try and cool themselves down. And you knew at that point that they only had a few hours left to live. And um, I assumed that this was going to have a huge impact on the elephant population. But um, so February 1994 came around and the African savannah made its usual near miraculous recovery. And the elephants that had left the park came back. And what do you know? most of them still had their infants. In fact, their infant mortality in that year was no different to an average year. So that meant they'd been able to go out and find food, but more importantly, find water. So the question was why? Why did some leave and some stay behind? And it wasn't just that um, only the um, ones with old matriarchs left. Crosstusk, the 15-year-old, she left. And the, it didn't um, dawn on me exactly what was happening here until um, a number of years later when I actually figured out the wider um, hierarchy, um, social hierarchy of the, of the elephants. And as I told you, you get um, elephants which um, live in clans, and these are probably related groups of females. And there are three clans that I was studying, and two of those clans had old matriarchs, and they were the ones that left the park. The clan that remained only had one female and she was, would have been about 30 to 35 years um, old at that time, whereas the ones that left were in their 40s. And when I looked back at rainfall figures for 
um, this ecosystem, sure enough, the last drought had been 1958 to 1961. The animals that remain in the park would not have been old enough to have survived, lived through that drought period, whereas those that left would have followed their grandmothers to drought refuge areas outside the park. And I think this is um, the important point that the impact of poaching may not actually be seen for many years after the actual poaching event takes place. Um, and you know, it can be sort of 10, 15, 20 years um, before you can actually see the impact of it. But equally, the, the reverse is true. If you retain a few older females in the population, it can have a fairly dramatic impact on the other animals of the population as well. And um, one of the interesting things about elephants is that they appear to be one of the few animals which exhibit true um, postpartum um, survival. So most animals, female animals, when they stop reproducing, they die. But elephants, they do tend to live a number of years um, after their, um, their last births. And I think that there's strong selection pressure for these females to live across many droughts, because if they can survive through a drought with their grandmother and then teach their grandchildren where to go, they can greatly in increase their inclusive fitness. And I should also say that, um, sorry, no, moving on. Um, so since then, the elephant populations um, in the park has done really well and had lots and lots of infants and um, growing at a, a very good rate. Um, so does that mean that all was well then um, with the elephants? Well, no. So as I said, the trade ban was put in place in 1989. And it was a very, very effective trade ban. It was, it was like someone turning off a tap. Um, and in 2007, the, you had big populations of, um, let me just get my um, laser pointer, um, big population of elephants in Botswana, 140,000 elephants, Tanzania, about 110,000 elephants, and also big populations uh, in Gabon and the Congo, um, etc. And then we started seeing, sorry, started seeing uh, problems manifest themselves in about 2006, 2007. And as usual, it started in the Congo Basin. And um, this is a place called Zangabai. Um, it's in uh, Central African Republic. And um, a colleague, former colleague of mine, Andrew Turkolo, who worked for Wildlife Conservation Society, which is an organization that Lara and I worked for for many, many years. She spent many years studying elephants over here in this by. And elephants would, would come in um, from all over um, the forest and move into this open area. They come for the salt, but they also come for the interaction. And she had a tree hide up over here, and she would monitor the elephants. And it was in places like this that the first poaching started to be seen. And the original poaching, we started linking it to the development of coltan mines. And coltan uh, was being used in um, mobile phones and now for electric vehicles. And so new mines were being set up often in DR Congo. And the problem is in many areas of DR Congo is that the soil is very infertile. And so it's not easy to grow things. And so what happens is that if you're going to support a mine, you just have an army of bush hunters that go out and they get a bush meat. And then they would shoot elephants and then they would sell the ivory. And by 2011, things were getting really quite dire. Um, this is, um, so the CITES had set up a program called uh, Monitoring of Legal Killing of Elephants. And so in various uh, protected areas around Africa, the rangers would go out and they would record if an elephant uh, had died, whether it died from uh, natural causes or whether it had been poached. And that produced a figure called Pike, the proportion of illegally killed elephants. And you can see in 2011, um, there are huge numbers of um, parks all across Central Africa, parts of um, Eastern Africa too, there were huge numbers of elephants that had been poached. And places like Congo lost large numbers of elephants. And in fact, forest elephants, we believe that their numbers dropped by about 60% over a 10 year period from um, 2002. 
And Central African Republic, the elephant population dropped from about 20,000 to about 2,000 elephants. And it wasn't just in the forested areas. Here was a count down this called the Great Elephant Census. It was done by the uh, Paul Allen uh, Foundation. And um, it was only done in savannas where they could actually count elephants from the air. And you could see across uh, Mozambique and Southern and Central Tanzania, there were large declines in elephant population. And in fact, in Tanzania, in 2010, the estimated figure for elephants was 110,000 elephants. By 2014, that was down to about 43,000. So over 60,000 elephants have been killed in Tanzania in four years. That's industrial scale killing. And the reason that the um, elephants were being killed was because the price of ivory was going up. In the year 2000, one kilo of ivory um, on the black market would cost about $370. By 2014, that same kilo of ivory cost two and a half thousand US dollars for one kilo. So it, some of these animals were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as a result, a huge wave of poaching again has started across Africa. And what was driving this? Well, one of the main things that was driving it was the burgeoning middle class in China. Now, the Chinese have had an interesting history with ivory. Of course, there are elephants in China and um, they have uh, traditionally used ivory, but for the most part, ivory in China was the preserve of just the aristocracy, the emperors, et cetera, and occasionally very, very wealthy business people. Um, but that has now changed. As I said, China is now a, um, a um, rapidly growing, has a rapidly growing economy and has over a hundred um, million people in the middle class. And um, they are buying ivory. And what happened was that the trade in ivory in 1989 had been banned. But in the early 2000s, several Southern African countries petitioned to have one-off sales of ivory because they wanted to sell the ivory for conservation money. So they sold it in the first uh, two rounds, they sold it to Japan. And then in 2007, they sold 108 tons of which 68 tons went to China and the rest went to Japan. And what the Chinese government did with this is that they would release this ivory in batches um, to ivory shops and um, ivory factories. And each piece of ivory came with a certificate saying that it was um, legal. But what would happen is that very often these shops would sell the piece of ivory, but retain the certificate and replace that ivory with illegally obtained ivory. And so the local domestic market was driving the illegal trade. Um, in ivory. And in 2011, um, over 38 tons of ivory were confiscated in at ports and, and um, in, in various places. And that equates to about 4,000 dead elephants. And normally, if you talk to people, law enforcement people, they say that normally you, you only get about uh, 10% of any contraband is actually caught. And so using these figures and also uh, the numbers of animals declining on, on the ground, um, it was estimated that about 35,000 elephants a year were being killed. So what can you do about this? Well, basically you have to do three things. You have to reduce, uh, make it harder for people to kill animals. You have to um, stop the, the supply chains and you have to stop the demand. And um, in places like Western Tanzania, this was a project that was um, that is run by WCS and they train up rangers, um, very elite rangers to tackle the poaching on the ground, just make it difficult for the poachers to operate in these areas. Many projects, including our own, um, we involve local communities, um, hiring people as village game scouts, and they would act as the eyes and ears. And it's a lot harder for poachers to operate if um, there are local people around who are looking out for them and then passing that information on to the authorities. There was also um, tightening up at the borders, at the ports, using things like sniffer dogs to make it, um, to find the ivory consignments and make it a lot harder to ship the ivory out. Now, I'm not an economist, but even I can tell you that if you reduce the supply of a commodity, 
and do nothing to reduce the demand, then all that's going to happen is that the price is going to go up. And so it was essential to try and reduce the demand of ivory in Asia and in places like China. Um, and surveys done over there found that many people simply didn't know that ivory came from um, dead elephants. They assumed it came from just elephants that had just fallen out, um, or they didn't, didn't know where it came from at all. And so many Chinese NGOs and other foreign NGOs, they started campaigns in China to get spread the message that ivory often leads to dead elephants. And they used people like Yao Ming, who's a very famous uh, basketball player, um, as spokespeople to get this message across. And when, well, at that time, China was the biggest market, about 70% of all ivory was going to China. The second biggest market was the United States. This is a shop in Manhattan. And um, at that time, you could buy ivory easily in the States. And um, you could buy it on eBay, et cetera. And while no one is suggesting that the domestic market in the US was actually driving um, a lot of the illegal trade, um, if you're going to be pointing fingers at people, then you need to make sure that you get your own house um, in order. And this is where global politics comes in. And um, in 2016, there was a meeting between President Xi of China and Obama um, of the US. And at that meeting, they declared that they would ban their domestic trade in ivory. And the US federal government, they put a complete state ban on all ivory. They made it very difficult to import any ivory from abroad. Um, and various states also set up bans uh, to stop you from buying and sell selling ivory within the state. And the Chinese did the same. Um, at, the end of 2017, they closed all of the ivory factories. And so there was no longer a domestic market in China. And this act of diplomacy, more than anything, I think, um, really impacted what was happening on the ground. Um, we started seeing that far less poaching was happening. Um, in 2019, the poaching levels were the lowest recorded since 2003 the price of ivory had been dropping in places like Eastern and um, Southern Africa. Um, elephant numbers were either stabilizing or increasing. Um, so lots of good results. Of course, traffickers will always find a weak link in a system. And now the market has moved very much to Central and um, Western Africa. Um, and places like Nigeria are now a major hub ivory and now it's going to places like uh, Vietnam and Myanmar and of course ivory can still be bought online but I think what this shows is that when the international community comes together and works in partnership with each other to tackle uh, these problems they can overcome really difficult problems like the ivory trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles, for this uh, fantastic presentation with beautiful images and uh, a walk through not only uh, the culture and research, but also uh, politics, history and sociology. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll now turn to your questions. So as a reminder, if, if uh, those in attendance have any questions for Charles, please post them. Uh, in the chat and we'll come back to you. Um, uh, I can see that there is a question from Normie. Normie, would you like to ask your question or shall I, shall I read it out? Um, well, I can read my question to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We would the love question, is, question is, is there a problem still with sexy flies? Because we were there 15 years ago and certainly it was a problem. It wasn't very touristy. And um, I just wondered whether um, it's a problem today, whether something's been sorted out because it was very unpleasant with the um, with the bites. Yes. Um, oh, there's still plenty of tetsis around Africa. Trust me, um, Tarangiri is uh, absolutely full of them. But the thing that you have to remember about tetsi flies is that um, it kept many areas. Um, free of, um, of human, hu human influence, um, just because the Tetsis would kill cattle, et cetera, and so less people would move into those areas, um, et cetera. So um, 
I know what you mean when you talk about you go into an area where there are huge numbers of taxis and it almost drives you mad. Um, but there are sort of positive ecological um, results from that as well. Yeah, it just seemed to be to be to be many more uh, flies there than there were in, say, Serengeti or Mara, other parts of um, Kenya. Yes, it depends on the vegetation type. So the thicker vegetation is what, what, the, what the flies like. And so in dense vegetation, like in the Miombo, in central and southern Tanzania, you get, and they can be absolutely thick. So mm. Tarangiri is about half, half, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, Diki, I can see that you, you have uh, posted a question. Would you like to ask it yourself or? I will... Yeah, no, that's, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I think you can yes, hear me. <laughs> very good. Um, thank you very much for a fabulous presentation. Uh, great work that you guys have been doing out there. Um, I was just wondering, and, and great work to see that the ivory price has definitely gone down. So all the efforts uh, on all the different areas are working are having an effect. And my question was about the marketeers of ivory today. Uh, personally, I cannot imagine anyone wanting to market marketeer um, ivory, but there must be some around still. Can those be banned at all? Or is there any, any activities done to those organizations that actually marketeer ivory? If ivory becomes an unimportant, you know, if you if you're able to sell it as an unimportant or at least marketeer it as an unimportant product, then maybe elephants would be left alone. Yeah, you know, it, it all boils down to demand. If people wouldn't buy ivory, no one would try to sell it because there's a lot of risk involved uh, to actually going out, hunting elephants, smuggling the ivory out, um, etc. cetera. Um, and the only reason they do it is because pe people like it. So people buy it. And that yeah, I people think is like it. I'm wondering if people like it because people have made, you know, kind of the marketeers are making it worthwhile to actually do it. So this is why. Oh, I'm oh you mean that the, yeah. the people who actually carve the ivory? Right. Or, right. Well, oh, okay, or got even it. the marketeers who actually, you know, kind of make it a a, a product that you'd want to have. I mean, if if I were, you know, you could imagine if you you want to buy cheese, then that that doesn't mm -hmm. sound very appealing. Mm -hmm. But obviously someone else is making some other kind of marketing uh, message around ivory that makes it appealing. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that you get two types of um, ivory craft people. The, the ones who churn out huge numbers of tiny pieces of chintz, really. Um, and then the master artists, like in that pho photograph that I showed you, I mean, there's astonishing pieces. I mean, these people have obviously spent years and years working with this. Um, and yes, basically we have to control both of those. You have to convince people not to, um, you know, to, to produce these, um, but really it boils down to the purchasing. If someone can sell ivory or pretty much any product, they're going to go into that and they're going to produce it. Um, and so really, I think we've got to look at the education of people and saying, look, don't buy it. Just, just don't buy it. It's, it's illegal in many areas and make it illegal uh, locally in um, different, you know, close the local ivory markets because then any ivory that is found is essentially illegal. I fully agree. Mm. There is a comment in the chat from El Smear also raising the question of, of selling um, ivory for, for the cheapest price, um, uh, depending where that is geographically, that might also potentially impact uh, the marketing of the product. Moving um, on to uh, the, the next question. Um, uh, Karen uh, Harrington has asked about the lift hand ban in Botswana. Uh, she's commented uh, that uh, she's saddened that Botswana cull 270 elephants per year, which uh, used to be a safe haven. I don't know, Charles, if, if you would like to comment on this as well. Yeah, so it's, it's a difficult one. So you, you've got both uh, culling, and then you've got sport hunting. Um, and what happens with, um, is that in, elephants are big animals and they can completely adjust the, their surrounding terrain. 
So they can turn a forested area into an open savanna area over a period of time. Um, now, eventually what happens is that you have what's called negative density dependence, which basically is the more elephants there are, there's less food. And so their reproduction slows down. But in the meantime, they can dramatically alter an environment. And then as a result, um, you might get local extinctions of either birds or insects in those environments because their um, vegetation, vegetation has been knocked down or whatever. And so that is the reason why um, and managers, wildlife managers, want to cull elephants. Now, um, some people say just let nature take its course, let them you know, do its thing, um, and um, eventually the populations will stabilize. But then again, you know, if, if your goal is to try and protect, let's say, a species of bird that relies on certain trees and those are all being knocked down by elephants, um, then you perhaps think of it from another way. And certainly in Botswana, you've got the largest populations in Africa, and that's why in some areas um, they are culling. Now in South Africa, they used to cull, um, but they stopped. They, 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 they stopped um, all the culling over there. Sport hunting is an interesting one because um, the thing about sport hunting is that it can bring in a huge amount of revenue, particularly to communities. Um, where sport hunting takes place, for instance, like in Namibia, in Zimbabwe. Um, and often these areas where people do the sport hunting are really isolated tracts of land. Uh, they may be full of tsetse flies. They um, basically sort of place that most tourists would never go to. So having a few sport hunters going in there um, a year will actually sustain those local communities and provide money for the communities. And what you have to realize is that in many of these places, if the sport hunting stops, you, the, the land doesn't get converted into a protected area national park. It typically gets used for agriculture, in which case they will then, you know, cut down the trees, um, they um, plow, plow things up, um, animals will get shot as crop raiders, etc. So I think that is the push and pull of this. And until we start getting alternative methods of getting funds into these isolated communities. And the, the big hope, of course, is the carbon market. Um, but until then, hunting is one of the few things that will actually keep these areas open. Thank you. Uh, we next have a question from John. John, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, me to read it out or if you'd prefer to ask your question. Oh, I'll speak up. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk, especially poignant about the social relationships among the uh, elephants. But my question, I, I thought I heard you say that uh, elephant populations were lower where there were no predators. And I was just curious about why that might be. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's, it's not that the populations were lower. It's that the group sizes are smaller. So in... Uh... Yeah, so, so basically in forested areas, um, a group will typically be two or three individuals. So a mother and her uh, two direct offspring. Um, and mm -hmm. so part of that may be related to uh, resources. Part of it may be, uh, there may be other factors that impact that. But personally, I believe that the lack of predators allows a young 15, 20 year old female to be alone with, by her, with her calf. Whereas in the savannah, um, she wouldn't be safe with her calf in that environment. Ah, uh, I see the difference. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll now move on to a question from Serena. Hi, thank you. I just had a question as to whether there is anybody uh, out there who puts forward an argument uh, from the premises uh, of uh, a shared interest in, in animal uh, conservation for a legally authorized but controlled trade as opposed to a complete ban? Oh, absolutely. Um, very, very much so. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> if you go to any CITES meeting, um, you, you will see it in full force. Typically, the Southern African countries want to be able to trade. They say that the only way to control the poaching, etc., is by um, being able to sell the ivory and then uh, <clears throat> basically use the offshoots of that uh, to be able to do anti-poaching, et cetera. Um, whereas um, other groups say you can't do that. And I'm in a camp where I do not think that you should be able to trade because the, the problem is 
there is so much potential demand for ivory. You know, it's, it's, it's this growing middle class so all across the world. And it, there, there's so much demand that we could, um, we could kill every single last elephant and still not meet that demand. Um, and so I think that the only way to basically control it is to ensure that no one is allowed to, to sell because the problem is that as soon as there is a legal market, as we've seen, it just encourages the illegal market. And that is the real problem. And the problem is it's incredibly difficult to control poaching in places like DR Congo or in you know, the, the, the forest of Central Africa. And while you might be able to get a real, really good grip on um, poaching, et cetera, in places like Southern Africa, if you open up that market, it impacts elephant populations all across Africa, which may not have those same resources. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't see any more questions in the chat, so believe that this concludes our Q&A and our talk with today's guest, Dr. Charles uh, Foley. Thank you very much, Charles, for this fantastic talk and uh, the vast array of comparisons. I particularly enjoyed the ones comparing elephant behaviors to, to us humans and how many parallels one can draw between uh, what these animals do and what patterns we have in our lives. Um, Thank you. Uh, we will be making uh, the recording of today's event available if anyone would like to rewatch it. And uh, in the meantime, I have put in the chat a link to a short post event feedback form uh, if, you, if anyone would like to share their comments with us or uh, make suggestions for future events of the Atlantic Circle in conversation series. Uh, this is the last event of 2021. We will resume in mid January uh, with a talk by Ruth Holton Hodson, uh, class of 77. So we look forward to hopefully seeing you. Then in the meantime, I would uh, like to wish you all happy holidays and a fantastic uh, start of, of the new year. Uh, thank you for joining us again. And once again, a big thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Charles Foley. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.